Here we go, and we are recording, great. So I'd like to uh, welcome everybody here today. Um, uh, this is uh, one of our uh, collaborative series. We started this uh, several years ago and it's been growing. Um, and today we are delighted to have Kim uh, Blankenship here. She received her PhD from Duke uh, in, the, in the Department of Sociology. Then she became faculty at Duke. Um, she was there for uh, several years and then went to Yale, uh, was at faculty at Yale University uh, before coming to American University where she is a, uh, not only professor, but associate dean of research at American University. Um, she has been a, uh, 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 the co-director of the SBS Corps for a number of years. Um, this past year, she migrated over to the developmental core and we are delighted to have her as part of our team now. Um, but she still has her roots in SBS. Um, and uh, uh, she has added a, a, a really strong uh, social and behavioral science point of view to our developmental core, which we're quite grateful for. Um, and without further ado, I am gonna let Kim take the reins right now. And I will remind everybody, if you can, uh, please uh, mute yourself uh, as you come in. And if you have questions, you can put them in the chat or um, Kim, do you want questions during the presentation or do you want them after? Or do you, or, Cause I know I, I do wanna have time for discussion at the end too. Yeah, um, I guess if there's clarifying or something I could, but otherwise I, I think I've saved enough time for um, questions at the end and okay. pr actually raise some I hopefully provocative questions. Yes. <laughs> so at the end of this, I want, I want people to start to think about how we can um, engage social behavioral sciences uh, to, into our own research, how we can um, interact and, and create multidisciplinary approaches, uh, which I think is a hallmark characteristic of HIV research. Um, and, and without further ado, Kim, thank you so much for agreeing to be with us today and presenting. And uh, I'm gonna uh, pass it off to you. I'm gonna go on mute. Okay, thanks everybody. Um, so I wanted to start with just a little bit of an overview to give you a um, sense of, this is my understanding of what I was asked to do. So hopefully I'm not disappointing those who asked me to do something. Um, but um, I was, I, uh, one thing that I wanted to do was uh, to talk about, uh, was asked to do was talked about social and behavioral approaches to HIV AIDS um, and um, what what those are constituted um, by. And, you know, this is like a pretty big, um, a, this is a, 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 gonna be a pretty superficial conversation about this because we're talking about a huge field of work um, that's in both the behavioral and the social sciences. And as Mark indicated, my expertise is actually in the social sciences, um, which is often grouped with the behavioral sciences, but which is what is quite distinct from behavioral sciences. Um, and um, uh, so, you know, I'll be more superficial about the others and a little less superficial about the social sciences. Um, but, uh, but I will try to touch on some questions that we social behavioral researchers ask, the kinds of explanations we offer, the kinds of data we analyze, and ultimately the kinds of interventions and solutions are suggested for improving health um, overall in HIV AIDS in particular. And then I was also asked to say a little bit about my own HIV AIDS related research, um, where it is situated in the social sciences uh, approach. And just as a kind of a preview and most generally to, to sort of establish at the beginning, I'm interested in how social inequalities of race, class and gender in particular, as they are embedded in larger social structures and systems of inequality, shape HIV related risk behaviors and prevention. And in particular, I focus a lot of my um, more current research on the systems of inequality represented by mass incarceration and housing vulnerability. And then finally, I wanted to turn to consideration of the question of why this matters um, for all of us, uh, regardless of the types of sciences that we do and how we can bring understandings from these different kinds of approaches together in collaboration. Um, and I'll just say by way of preview again, that ultimately all of our work is produced in a social world and is influenced by that world. And this I think is critical for understanding how best to address um, health in this world. So that's uh, a bit of an overview. Now, um, just to situate this a little bit of um, context um, and uh, you know, again, sort of introducing, um, there's a few different ways, you know, when we think about solutions, when we think about how to analyze pro uh, health problems and the solutions to them, um, we can kind of, um, you know, think about 
again, very much simplifying, you know, there's sort of biological and biomedical understandings, you know, what types of diseases, how do they, how do, um, you know, we get them, what substances in the body or pre-existing conditions, other factors might hasten or slow the um, progress um, and how, did that, how does that work? And then ultimately for the purposes of identifying medications or med biomedical approaches that could prevent or reduce the seriousness or cure the disease. With the behavioral understanding, we're asking questions about, you know, what behaviors put us at risk? Are some behaviors riskier than others? How do we make people aware of their risks? Are there tools and practices that can reduce those or enhance the quality of life or prolong um, longevity? Um, and how do we um, make people aware of those tools? What factors interfere with the use of those tools uh, it facilitate or um, impede? And then we have, you know, what are the social science perspectives, which often are kind of framed as sort of social determinants of health, or I like to think a little bit more dynamically social, the social determination of health. Most typically, these are questions like what social factors interfere with behavioral change or interfere with up the uptake of biomedical solutions or what factors facilitate um, the you know, behavioral change and the uptake. But beyond interference, um, I think um, thinking more dynamically about how risk is socially determined, what social factors and processes are more important, um, in, uh, most important in this determination process. Um, how is the use of biomedical approaches socially determined and how do we intervene in this process? Um, are sort of you know, some of the kinds of questions that a more social um, science perspective would, um, would imagine. Um, so, and these are often um, conceptualized lined up a kind of continuum, right? You know, where um, we really want to resolve the um, health problem by finding biomedical interventions that, you know, can cure or prevent um, or uh, minimize the impacts. And um, we want to think about, you know, in the meantime, when we have these, and even after we have these solutions, how do we get people to, um, how do we get people to adopt them and use them? Um, and so we develop behavioral change interventions to do that. And sort of for more far along um, in this sort of causal chain, you know, how do we think about the social determinants, um, the barriers to and the facilitators of, of these changes? And these often at times involve, involve more structural interventions, kind of thinking about ways to address the um, structure. And again, they're kind of organized in this causal chain of, you know, each of these is independent of each other. Um, and the social determinants are often called, you know, the more distal causes versus the more proximal causes. Um, and um, they're conceptualized in this kind of way. So um, in my undergraduate class then, so, that, so if I talk about this uh, uh, to, to sort of uh, help, under, help my students understand um, the distinctiveness of a social science framework and the types of interventions it suge suggests. Um, I usually use this framing of the Titanic. It's kind of a simplified, a simplified version of this is around there, out there, but um, I tried to expand on this version. And it goes something like this. So if we were to um, analyze the health outcomes associated with the sinking of the Titanic, um, from different analytical frameworks. Okay, so first we see that there was an extraordinary um, number of deaths um, um, in the, as an outcome of the accident. Um, if we were to uh, focus on different uh, explanations for this, um, if we were more of a biomedical, we might conduct some autopsies of those who died and we show that they drowned. Um, uh, if we were focusing more on behavioral risk factors, we might um, indicate, find that, you know, it was those people who used a lifeboat um, who were um, least likely to die and those who, used, who didn't use a life, lifeboat were most likely to die. And from a social science or social determinants perspective, we would note that the greatest kind of demographic risk factor was traveling in the third class. 75% of travelers in the third class uh, perished as compared to 63% of men and 26% of women. So we don't really have any biomedical interventions um, for addressing drowning. There's no pill you can take that you know, allows you to survive sinking to the bottom of the ocean or whatever. Um, so um, our, the types of interventions for addressing the behavioral risk factors um, and our behavioral observations might con um, conclude that to reduce the number of deaths in future accidents, 
We should make everyone know about the um, life-saving capacities of lifeboats. And we might even encourage all passengers to get lessons uh, in how to get into lifebo uh, lifeboats. And we might even provide such lessons free of charge to make it possible for uh, third-class passengers to get these skills as well. But of course, we know that this approach would not have done much to increase the survival rate had another Titanic-like vessel faced a similar fate. In contrast, this focus on individual behavior, a social determinants framework would seek to refocus our attention on the risk environment to understand how it constructs the choices available to individuals or the opportunities for individuals to make choices. It asks us to focus on the barriers to and facilitators of healthy choices. And in the case of this simplistic Titanic example, such an approach would note that many passengers died because there were not enough lifeboats available to them or they weren't able to get into them. Um, so the problem is, it's not that they had, um, that they made bad choices or poorly informed choices or lacked skills, but rather that they had cho uh, poor choices or bad choices to make. So focusing our interventions on such an analysis would result not in the develop necessarily or only exclusively of educational materials or lifeboat entry skills workshops, um, at least not only such um, but instead, perhaps, it might suggest interventions in which boat captains were required to um, increase the number of lifeboats, or if they weren't willing to do that, where policies were implemented that required one, one lifeboat per X number of passengers, which would allow for everybody um, to have a lifeboat or, um, and be able to get into them. So when I use this example in my um, class, my students are always amused at the suggestion that we could solve the problem of drowning when the Titanic sank by providing information on the value of and the best way to use lifeboats. But you know, if you think about it, how different is that from informing people that they can prevent HIV by, uh, by using condoms and perhaps helping them to build their skills in doing so if they can't get condoms or informing injection drug users that sharing syringes can transmit HIV, but not making syringes available, or even worse, making it illegal to carry them. Um, impacting on the HIV and STI risk environment um, by expanding access to sex education, to condoms, to STI and HIV testing, to syringes, um, including by changing policies and ensuring these policies are enforced, has been actually an important strategy for reducing HIV STI risk to be sure. And yet these diseases persist. And these strategies are not enough. And indeed they haven't been as easy as you might think they should be even to implement. And why is that? I would argue it's because these solutions are implemented in a social context that is characterized by substantial social inequalities based on fundamental categories such as gender and class and race and sexuality that are deeply rooted in and reproduced by social structures, systems, institutions, and relations. And this has critical implications for the likely success of any of these interventions, including their success at being implemented at all, as well as their success in reducing disease rates overall and equities and diseases in particular. So let's extend the Titanic example to illustrate. Suppose we used our risk environment framework and got laws passed to require that title, uh, Titanic II was equipped with enough lifeboats for all passengers on board. If those lifeboats are accessible only from the main deck, there will likely be passengers who are never able to make it to the lifeboats because they are down there at the bottom of the ship. So this strategy alone may have limited success. Moreover, if some people are down at the bottom of the ship because they're poor or because they're of their race or gender or sexuality and are rele relegated to the worst spaces at the bottom of the ship, either because they're expressly excluded from the better spaces at the top of the ship because of their class or their race or their gender, that is because they're expressly discriminated against best based on those categories, or they're effectively excluded because the cost of the tickets or because they're seemingly neutral rules that restrict their access based on other categories that are highly associated with their gender, class, and or race. Um, like example, for example, rules that would relegate to the bottom, uh, them to the bottom because they have a criminal justice history, or as seems to have been the case in the days of the Titanic, because they were more likely to have infectious diseases and so they needed to be barred from um, contact with the first class passengers. 
then requiring enough lifeboats for all passengers may result in fewer lives lost, um, but greater inequities in the social distribution of those losses. So more people at the upper levels of the ship um, and in the cat privileged categories may have had better access and ability to get into the boats, but um, leaving behind still um, those towards the bottom of the ship who had been excluded. When we come to recognize that interventions to address health must, must be developed with an understanding of how social inequalities and the structures and institutions that undergird them shape health and vulnerability, this often leads to efforts to develop intervention approaches that try to minimize the impact of these social vulnerabilities. For example, in the Titanic uh, case, perhaps we could employ some peer navigators or social service workers and locate them down at the bottom of the ship. Their job would be to help guide some of the passengers from the bottom to the top. Maybe they would even know some shortcuts, at least some of them, or have keys to some of the doors that not everyone has keys to, to make their success even more likely. Or perhaps we could develop interventions for these potential passengers that would empower them to advocate for themselves when booking their tickets to try to get better deals on better ship locations from the travel booking agencies. These approaches are not unlike um, a lot of the interventions that are proposed to help facilitate vulnerable populations to better navigate systems that are not necessarily responsive to their needs. For example, providing intensive case management services to help them better access services that may be available but disconnected and confusing to access um, or hard for them to access because of their um, living situations. Or maybe empowering, uh, empowering patients to ask their doctors for STI or HIV tests when their doctors won't offer to provide them. Such solutions aren't directly challenging the overall structure of the system and focusing on changing it, perhaps because it's seen as impossible or too complicated or beyond the scope of a health intervention. But they are seeking to reduce the impact of social vulnerability on health outcomes. And they certainly are shown to have an impact to a greater or lesser degree. But in many instances, they can also be shown to perpetuate some forms of vulnerability by, for example, determining, however implicitly, that some people are more deserving of assistance than others. Even more generally, in our Titanic example, it's also saying that none of these hypothetical strategies ask the bigger questions. For example, what sort of um, system is a large ship built where there aren't enough lifeboats to begin with? Where a ship travels fast in dark icy waters and can't withstand a crash with an iceberg? Where social class or gender or race dictates your chances of surviving? How can we um, identify and challenge that underlying system? Okay, so I know the Titanic example is probably getting a bit tiresome at this point, but I just want to draw one other um, analogy in trying to illustrate sort of a, uh, this uh, more social perspective. In spite of all the issues I've just raised, it is important to recognize that lifeboats are an effective tool for surviving a sinking ship and behavioral interventions that help ensure people um, know how to get into them may save lives. Similarly, peer navigator, peer navigator and individual empowerment programs make a difference and can help people navigate the structural barriers that restrict their access um, to um, health and health-saving technologies. Just because there are limitations of these interventions doesn't mean that we shouldn't give up, we should give up on them altogether. Similarly, we do have effective tools for preventing the acquisition and transmission of STIs and HIV. For example, condoms. But unlike lifeboats, I think, anyway, condoms are imbued with clear and complex social meanings. The use of condoms takes place in the context of a relationship. And these relationships are shaped by social understandings of, among other things, gender, race, class, sexuality. Condom use then is really a social practice as much as it is an individual behavior. And it has a social meaning. It's not just an abstract neutral behavior. Think about it this way, theories of health behaviors at their simplest would tell us that people wanna do what's best for their health. In the case of HIV, if they understand that HIV can be transmitted through sexual condom uh, contact and that condoms can prevent this transmission, they will use condoms. So informing them of the dangers and how to address them um, and they will, will, will lead them to change their behavior, behaviors. And this does work, but only to some extent. Why? 
well, maybe for some people, it wasn't possible to act on the information because they had no access to condoms, like in the life in the case of lifeboats, no access to lifeboats. So we could resolve, we could address this problem by making condoms available, maybe even doing this in a fun way. So now some people who didn't have access to condoms have access and more people are able to change their behaviors. But it's not always easy to put bowls of condoms around. Why? Well, someone has to pay for them. But let's say that we have a rich donor and money isn't the object. Still, making them available doesn't happen in a vacuum. It happens in a social context. And condoms aren't just a piece of polyurethane. They're a product imbued with social meaning and making them available is a social action where some sets of interests may be opposed to the very idea. And the people and institutions that express their opposition may not be representative of the people or the social groups that are most in need of condoms and least able to find other means of accessing them. Okay, but let's say this, that this strategy does result in greater access and more people get access through this distribution or even because they buy them at the store or whatever. People still have to use condoms and this isn't a simple matter of putting them on. So for one thing in heterosexual sex, women can't use the most common type of condom, which is a male condom. They have to rely on a man to use them or they have to negotiate with a man to use them. And these negotiations take place in a con social context. Social context in which women are structurally unequal to or less powerful than men. And African-American women are located in the especially socially vulnerable intersection of race and gender. But even in loving relationships, no matter the race, ethnicity, or gender or the, of the partners, condom use is not a simple neutral behavior. It is a social practice, one that's imbued with social meaning and one that in the act of engaging in it is both reflecting and producing social relations. Different types of relationships have different meanings and using a condom or asking for condom use to be used raises issues of trust, of stigma, politics. Or consider contexts where there's considerable medical mistrust. In the survey that we did with low-income New Haven residents, we found that about uh, you know 42 percent of uh, Black people in respondents indicated that they agreed and thought it was true that the government promotes the use of condoms in order to limit the number of births of certain groups. Um, and this is. There's very real reasons for believing this, given the long history of sterilization campaigns to limit births among black and brown people in the United States. So the point is, um, you know, that these are not neutral technologies, and maybe we know more about the complex meanings and how to address the complex meanings they may have in social relationships. Um, and, but we also need to start thinking about the other ways and other types of meanings they have as well. Similarly, biomedical tools like regular testing, preventive drugs, treatments, vaccinations um, are produced and used in social settings and can't be disassociated from the social meanings that derive from these settings. I think we have you know, the example of COVID provides a clear um, indicator of this. So social context matters and social theory matters for understanding how we conceptualize social context and its relationship to HIV AIDS. Um, so I'm not going to get into a description of the different theoretical frameworks, except to say that in my own work, I would move away um, from the more common frameworks that separate biomedical tools and individual behaviors from the social context in which they exist, um, and that view social determinants as independent of and distinct from individual behaviors and biomedical tools, um, and located along some sort of causal chain from proximal um, to more distal. Um, and rather seek to apply a social science framework that views um, as most effective for addressing HIV prevention, interventions that are based on an understanding of the social meanings attributed to the practices and tools, um, uh, uh, interventions based on understanding the social meanings um, yes, that are given to these tools for prevention or treatment um, and how they are shaped by the social context in which they're used. Um, and in this, it's a framework that recognizes how certain fundamental uh, inequalities rooted in structures and systems and institutions that produce and perpetuate them situate people in ways that make them more or less vulnerable to diseases, including HIV AIDS. And to recognize this complexity is not to suggest that we can't do anything unless we take on the system as a whole. Um, it's not the case, we can and we have intervened in successful ways. But it does mean that we need to always be aware of the different ways that the social world shapes the particular experiences of vulnerability. 
we need to consider whether some strategies are better suited to, to the needs of some forms of vulnerability than others. And we may need to make sure that we aren't focusing only on strategies that systematically benefit some or even worse actually, however inadvertently, provide these benefits to some while increasing the uh, vulnerability of others. Um, so in the, in the broadest sense, I think, you know, we need to think about the most successful interventions don't just reduce overall disease prevalence, but also address inequalities, inequities, and prevalence. So with that said, let me just get a bit more concrete by discussing some of my current research. Um, and this is research, uh, uh, this particular study is just the most recent version of this, but the, the work is premised on the idea that to um, address the social structural inequalities on which inequities in HIV rest, we need to focus on understanding how current systems that support these inequities shape vulnerability to and impacts of HIV and AIDS. And in this regard, my focus has really been on mass incarceration and housing vulnerability. Um, both of these, um, independent of each other, mass incarceration and housing are recognized as social determinants of health and also are implicated in understanding um, HIV AIDS related vulnerabilities. But in my, um, in my research, um, I'm seeking to move towards more of a social determination frame by um, conceptualizing each of these systems as signifying a whole set of historically rooted policies and practices, both intentionally established with racist, sexist, and classist purposes and operating to reproduce race, class, and gender inequities, sometimes in unanticipated forms. And also recognizing that HIV AIDS related the impacts of each have to be understood in a context where the other is simultaneously operating. Just as some background information, you probably know this, but the un unfortunate st statistic, which is that the US incarcerates a larger share of its population than any other country in the world. This, it might be the case now that this is slightly updated. It might be one country that's more um, incarcerates more. Um, and furthermore, that it's important that these rates, even though these rates have declined over the last 15 um, or so years, black and brown people remain disproportionately likely to be incarcerated. And incarceration, incarceration statistics are just one in indication of mass incarceration. I'm using this language to convey really a whole system that grew out of and continues to hold, uphold racism and though less discussed, I think gender and class inequities as well. The reach of the criminal justice system um, extends way beyond the individual experience of incarceration and includes things like community supervision, uh, prisonization, which refers to the extent to which our social institutions are starting to reflect the characteristics of prisons, hyper-policing and community surveillance, um, which is you know, sort of uh, surveillance that goes beyond um, Go, goes beyond uh, criminalized uh, uh, policing um, and criminalization, which is signified by the ways that individuals with a criminal justice or a criminal legal history continue to be punished even after their sentence has been served. In fact, um, uh, uh, one sociologist, uh, George Lipsis argues that through this process, a single instance of incarceration, no matter the length can become a lifetime sentence. Um, and one of, one of the places we see this is actually in the area of housing. So in the United States, we have a serious shortage of affordable rental housing. Um, there's no state in the country where a full-time minimum wage um, is sufficient to rent an unsubsidized fair market two bedroom unit. Um, so we do have subsidized housing policies that are our primary mechanism for addressing this by increasing um, access to affordable housing. But even so, fewer than one in four eligible households receive um, uh, housing assistance in the form of public housing and vouchers. And waiting lists in the United States are average uh, nationally, two years, but they can stretch decades in some urban areas, including where I do my research in New Haven, where they're about 10 years um, long. Um, this is compounded by numerous barriers specific to incarceration. Landlords and employers can conduct criminal background checks, the results of which can be used to deny people with criminal legal histories, um, leases or opportunities to earn income to support housing costs. Federal and state policies can consider an incarceration history as grounds for exclusion from housing subsidies for um, a, a minimum of three years. 
So this problem with affordable and accessible housing is exacerbated for those with or involved with those who have a criminal legal history. Um, and that has repercussions throughout entire communities. So the Just House study seeks to understand how mass incarceration and housing vulnerability intersect to construct a context in which sexual practices occur and are given meaning and with what implications for HIV AIDS related inequities. Um, and we have three specific aims. Um, one is, to sort, is a more aggregate aim to look across um, the United States and, and uh, characterize housing policies as more or less restrictive and understand how that may relate to um, disease rates. The second is to understand from the perspective of vulnerable populations, um, how mass incarceration and housing vulnerabilities intersect to impact, impact sexual risks uh, associated with HIV um, and produce potentially um, race inequities in those risks. And the third is to examine from the perspective of various implementers of housing, criminal legal, social service policies and programs, how they interpret and implement their, respons their uh, responsibilities and why they do so in the way that they do. So just, you know, in doing this work, um, we use a lot of different methods that are common for um, the, the um, social sciences. Um, and, and to some extent as well, the behavioral sciences. Um, so for aim one, to analyze the impacts of housing policies on HIV rates, um, we collected uh, these policies, which are publicly available from housing authorities across the country for the cities over 100,000, went through an extensive process of identifying the sections of the policies related specifically to restrictions on access related to access and potential for eviction um, related to criminal hi legal history and drug related crimes. Um, and we have this paper that was published in AJPH that develops a score for restrictiveness. Um, and we have another analysis we're writing up that suggests that restrictiveness of local housing authority policies are um, consistently and significantly associated with higher HIV rates at the prevalence at the county, um, as well as with uh, gonorrhea rates, though not with syphilis and chlamydia rates. Um, we, um, for AIM-2, we also used uh, co common um, techniques uh, for the social sciences. We recruited a sample of 400 low-income residents in New Haven. Half of them had been released from prison or jail um, within the last year uh, before the start of the study. And then we administered detailed uh, surveys, collecting data every six months for follow-up interviews. Um, and on a wide range of topics related to housing vulnerability, mass incarceration, economic, socioeconomic circumstances, various types of health issues, sexual practices, substance use, and so forth. Um, and we also did a subsample, we collected qualitative interviews where we sat down and just you know, recorded, discussed um, in more open-ended uh, framework uh, with, our, with 54 of these participants. Um, more in greater detail to really better understand um, their experiences um, with these policies. Uh, and those were also longitudinal. We did baseline and three follow-ups. Uh, well, then we did a COVID follow-up as well, a fourth follow-up. Um, so uh, we've used quantitative and qualitative methods of analysis to um, expand our understanding based on this. And um, for example, we have a paper in AIDS and behavior where we use multivariable logistic regression analyses to um, look at associations between forced moves, front landlords forced moves, and um, various practices with HIV uh, associated with HIV sexual risk um, to demonstrate that um, these forced moves are associated with um, risk. We have another analysis of survey data that suggests that when, for those on probation or parole, um, they're more likely to have um, engage in traditionally conceptualized uh, HIV related risk behaviors and that they're even more likely to do so if they also are experiencing housing vulnerability, suggesting sort of the intersection of housing and criminal justice history. And we have a paper based on the qualitative data that's coming out in AIDS and behavior where we suggest how women's pursuit of long-term committed relationship in low-income racially segregated neighborhoods, that is in contexts that are characterized by many different manifestations of housing vulnerability and mass incarceration, put them at risk for HIV rather than their so-called risky behaviors. So it's really the things they do to try to um, maintain long-term committed relationships. 
um, that are putting them at risk. And in this way, we're arguing that the social context and not the behaviors constitutes their risks. And so that we need to start thinking about how to change that context in real ways by changing policies and programs and so forth. So that's a quick run through. Um, and I, now just to last, uh, you know, to return to the last question and start thinking about, you know, potential for brainstorming about what this means for collaboration. Why should we care about this if you're not a social scientist? Um, what does this have to do with, you know, me and my work? Why should we care about the theories, methods, and insights of social science research? Um, and, um, you know, I would suggest that, first of all, in the broadest sense, all of our work is produced in a social context and is necessarily shaped by that context. That context produces the problems we study and it prioritizes the questions we research, the methods we use to research them, the resources available to ask, study, and answer them. Um, and, you know, the history of HIV AIDS research really um, demonstrates this truth, this um, itself, you know, the activism that, you know, that made something that was happening kind of brought it to public attention and affect the way um, the priorities um, that it was given, um, the, the research was given, just a few examples. If we recognize that the context in which our science developed is one shaped by deeply rooted structures of inequality, for example, you know, we hear a lot about structural racism these days and intersectionality, and that they're reflective of a history that has unfolded in ways that have systematically excluded some and privileged others, we really have to interrogate our research accordingly. Um, and we have to consider how to move intentionally towards a more inclusive understanding of, in this case, HIV AIDS, um, which ultimately will um, result in more effective interventions. Um, so at just the very broadest, having that awareness um, is important. And what does that mean then for, you know, the possibilities of social and behavioral clinical basic science kind of collaborations? And I really want to move us beyond biomarkers because I think that's where a lot of, you know, a lot of behavioral and social scientists are um, incorporating, you know, measures of exposure to HIV or, uh, uh, you know, viral, viral suppression and so forth into um, their studies. And I think those are very um, important um, ways of collaborating. But I also wanted to sort of think beyond um, those types of, so I put some questions, you know, uh, for example, um, you know, what do we need to know about the bodies whose cells and tissues we're studying? Um, you know, um, what kinds of, what, what, what things are important to understand? Um, you know, can we create animal models that be better represent the experiences of life in these different kinds of social contexts? Um, what do we need to understand about the context in which our biomedical and behavioral interventions are being introduced before maybe we develop them or as we develop them? So, you know, it's, uh, right now they're developed sort of potentially um, independently of that understanding and then behavioral and social scientists are asked to help, you know, convince people to use them um, or whatever. Um, and you know, ultimately sort of the big pector question, is it acceptable, you know, if we reach 90, 90, 90, but the 10, 10, 10 are all black and brown and are poor and or trans people. But what is our ultimate goal with, um, you know, in, in addressing this um, disease? So I'll stop there and questions and discussions. Thank you, Kim. Um we can open up to questions. I do have one question, especially with this last slide. Um, going beyond bi biomarkers, but have you looked, have you had basic scientists look at, for example, the HPA axis, hypothalamus, pituitary, adrenal axis, looking at long-term stress on your on these pop, on the populations that you look at? They're very vulnerable. And I could imagine that there's a chronic stress level that would negatively affect um, uh, the aging brain and a couple of that with being um, HIV positive, you're looking at kind of almost like a double whammy there. Have you, have you incorporated any of that biological um, science into your research or do you know of anything that's been done like that? Yeah, I mean, I haven't really, uh, I, I, haven't rec I haven't done any biomarkers um, research myself. I mean, my, the kind of research I do is more considered um, uh, basic, social behavioral um, research or whatever. 
but um, but I have thought about it at some point. And I um, believe that there are, you know, stre chronic stress is kind of one of the major, whether in HIV or other types of health outcomes um, that people are, and, and it is one of the things that we thought about um, for some, you know, future research that if we were to do bio, uh, biomarkers research, that would probably be one of the things that we would focus on um, because it's so connected to, you know, these issues of incarceration and policing and um, so forth. So, and I'm pretty sure that there are people who do that type of, um, who have um, connected, um, you know, those types of biomarkers um, in their behavioral or social um, research, um, but I've not, I haven't done that. Yeah, Ms. Sylvia, I want to thank you. This has really been very interesting. I think that uh, what the Developmental Corps was hoping for, um, certainly you did. You sparked so much things to think about, um, you know, that just you, you, when you think of test tubes, you never think of any of these other things. And I'm not knocking test tubes, please don't get me wrong. But what you brought up and how you brought it up in the Titanic, you could use forever as far as I'm concerned. You brought home a lot of information. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sylvia. <laughs>
you know, how seriously uh, they're taking um, this notion of, um, you know, uh, vulnerability and uh, structural inequality and how uh, in terms of, uh, and how we should be researching it and also how seriously they're taking it and other scientific um, funders as well um, in terms of thinking about their own, the own ways, their own institutions and practices and procedures and whatever, um, you know, uh, are part of the problem, um, potentially, you know, or, uh, you know, being more intentional and in looking around and saying, you know, are there ways in which our policies and practices are exclusive um, at all different types of levels and, you know, making certain types of science more or less, um, uh, possible. So, you know, in that sense, that's been um, a challenge, but, you know, I feel like there's some potential right now um, um, to, to actually for the, that, that the, the NIH is actually raising some of these questions and looking internally as well as externally. Um, and so that's, you know, makes me optimistic or hopeful, I'll say. Yeah, thank you. It's actually pretty similar to the answers I think I would give, which is that the collaboration and the impact you have is what makes it worthwhile as, as an epidemiologist. But um, the frustrations are, you know, constantly trying to fund your ideas and get support for your ideas. And also when people don't look at the data and do things in public health and not looking at the data, it drives you crazy. So um, thank you. For and your it's response. also, you know, the other thing is, it's like, especially when you're doing qualitative research, and you know these these issues are complex, and um, you know, uh, uh, well, you you know they're they're complex, and the stories that you tell, like, uh, are I ha I always feel, especially with the qualitative research, like I uh, I have to be careful about how I present like results or whatever, you know, because it's real people's stories and real thing. I'm not just talking about the potentially revealing their. Um, you know, their identities, which is what IRBs are worried about. I'm talking more about just, you know, characterizing that people, people hear what you say and they interpret, um, interpret that in very different ways, you know, and can turn it into blaming and, um, you know, and attributions that aren't fair. And so um, I think that's another thing, always worrying about you want to do this to get information out, but you have to be careful about how to frame that, that it's not misinterpreted, um, you know, and ends up doing, uh, perpetuating the very harms that your research is, you know, trying to, um, to address. Okay, uh, we have a question in the chat uh, from Nalini. Nalini, do you want to uh, uh, ask or do you want me to read it out? Okay, I can read it out. She says, uh, thank you for elevating social and behavioral sciences. Why is citizenship, citizenship status not getting enough attention, even if mass incarceration and housing instability are clearly contributing to the HIV spread? I bring this up because I have long heard the race, class, gender, trinity coming to the fore when, when we do have other growing sources of inequality. Right. No, I think that's a fair, um, a, a fair conceptualized, a, a, you know, a fair point. I mean, I would say uh, a couple of things. I mean, one thing is, you know, that I fo the, the systems I focus on mass incarceration and um, housing, first of all, you know, others could, others could make a case that there's other sort of fundamental underlying um, systems that are supporting, um, you know, in, inequities in our, um, in our social world. And, um, and I wouldn't necessarily, um, you know, argue with them. Um, and I feel we, can, you know, we're, we're it's everybody to everybody's benefit for people to be focusing on a whole bunch of different of these systems, but nobody can do them all, you know, at one time. Um, so developing expertise where interest lies, um, and you know, I I think that that there are um, the, the uh, other sorts of other kinds of inequities that also need to be um, added into the conversation um, and thought about. These, these frameworks can still be used to analyze the um, way in which those operate or whatever, um, you know, but the specifics are um, uh, uh, distinct in some ways. Um, so I think that can happen. Um, and, you know, there's only so much, um, so collaborate with other people that are studying immigration, 
um, issues and so forth um, is a way of expanding, um, you know, this kind of framing um, and um, or, you know, um, look, paying, I didn't really, you know, address the literature that's already out there about, um, you know, immigration and immigration um, status, um, but that's definitely um, an important source of inequality. Um, and others may have, there may be other um, sort of more systemic um, embedded um, inequities that, um, you know, that need to be paid attention to too. Some things are similar, some things are different. Uh, Kim, let me ask you uh, a more general question about uh, social behavioral uh, science. Uh, so in, in basic science, we have some um, kind of small uh, questions and we have some general questions. And basically uh, uh, it's kind of, uh, uh, we do not have uh, established uh, kind of uh, theories or rules or uh, that govern all the H uh, human and uh, in particular HIV biology. We don't know everything yet and I, I doubt we ever will. I just wonder about social and behavioral science because you spoke more about some uh, kind of more of implementation, I would say, more of uh, kind of uh, how this uh, science areas help make life better uh, for people. But I wonder whether you can state that the general concepts are all well established in these areas, that we know how uh, everything operates, how everything kind of connected. And what we just need to do is to think of the ways how to better implement those general rules to uh, make uh, life uh, better. Um, <clears throat> okay, uh, I'm not sure completely, but uh, first of all, I. I don't know that I would say that we know how, um, you know, all these things operate, um, you know, completely like, uh, so, so I think that's part of what we try to do with our research is, you know, we know they, they have some, they have to have some general impacts. Um, and, um, but how exactly that operates and how they work, you know, which policies, for example, you know, are there some um, policies and programs and approaches that are more harmful, that are more that perpetuate more um, inequities or whatever, or make it more challenging than others? Um, that sort of thing. We and um, you know if we because we can't do everything all at once, right? So where what what would be the most effective um, uh, place to focus attention, um, you know, both in terms of sort of the big picture things and then the specific ways in which they're playing themselves out. Um, we don't, we need, you know, more understanding of how impacts may vary across these different categories, including which, uh, you know, from the previous question, you know, there, what, uh, to what extent are, um, you know, say immigrant, um, you know, uh, groups and so forth impacted. So, um, you know, I don't think uh, maybe some of it, I think, you know, there's more you can say, okay, everybody knows that, you know, if you're poor, you're going to have bad health outcomes or whatever. And now we just need to figure out what to do about it. But there's still a lot, uh, you know, there's still a lot to figure out in terms of the best way to handle that. And people will have different, you know, lots of different in the real world of social policy about how to actually accomplish that um, so forth. So, um, so in that sense, I think it's still, you know, there's still a lot to understand. I think one of the things is sometimes it feels as a social scientist that um, other groups, particularly, you know, more basic biomedical feel like, um, you know, they're re it's really easy to do this research and um, you know we basically already know all all there is to know um, at this point and that's 
it's not that easy to do um, this research. And um, there's still a lot to really understand. Um, Thank you. So we have uh, time for a few more questions. Uh, Tom has asked, what are your experiences or thoughts about involving community stakeholders early in the research process and throughout the process to help ensure we focus on community priorities and develop interventions likely to be accepted and how do we get yeah. there? No, I think that's, a, you know, that is a really, really important. We have done co uh, community-based participatory research, different types of it along through my uh, career um, and uh, more or less models reflecting that, you know, we do have a very active um, community board um, that's, you know, worked with us to um, uh, both develop our tools and so forth, and then also identify in analyzing our data, um, what are some, what pieces of data are most of interest to them and so forth, which I know is, you know, not um, a fully um, inclusive kind of model. Um, we're also in some new research that we're trying to propose, trying to really look at sort of maybe a little bit in, uh, related to my, my, Michael's question, um, some different types of approaches, including um, community-based groups that are like working more um, within the communities on issues of um, incarceration and, you know, almost, almost more, to some extent, more kind of social movement-y type of, you know, organized community organizing to, um, to address problems associated with um, mass incarceration. Um, and that involves both advocating for specific types of uh, legislation, but also providing um, supportive community um, strategies, you know, in support of um, people. And this is particularly in New Haven um, who are trying to um, returning to the community or and so forth. So um, and so we want we're, we're thinking about a project which would um, sort of compare this kind of more community-based um, approach to some of the more professionalized um, strategies for addressing um, you know, what the, what's different and, um, and so on. So, um, so yeah, I think, and I think you know, that um, ultimately having multiple perspectives and multiple engagements with people having multiple different forms of experience with um, these issues can only help us in identifying, you know, where the best, um, what, what, the, what the experiences are that need to be addressed and what potential solutions, you know, are gonna be more or less effective in doing that. So we have a time for a couple last minute questions here. And, I, and a few of them kind of uh, come in together. Um, Eva asked about how do we reach the Tusky mindset and that leads into kind of Beta's question about how do we uh, influence beliefs that are deeply embedded in a population to accept treatments. Um, and kind of going back to the Tusky, uh, Tusky mindset is more about how do we gain the trust of, uh, for example, African Americans and to get them into studies. Um, I mean, that's a complex question. I think, you know, one thing is, um, I know, you know, and COVID is, you know, a good, what are people trying to do? Like there's this, you know, and there's a range of interpretations of, um, you know, why people are um, reluctant or fearful of, you know, vaccines and so forth, for example. Um, so, you know, and a, one strategy that's uh, used is to have more, um, you know, spokespeople from the communities, um, you know, that are being, uh, ha have them doing more work, work within the black churches, for example, you know, um, work with, uh, you know, people who are legitimate, not the politicians of the world to say, you know, oh, I got the George Bushes and the um, Joe Biden's, you know, to show that they got their vaccines, but, you know, to work within the communities and the people that are considered, um, you know, experts and trusted um, members of the community um, to, um, to help, uh, uh, you know, make, help people understand why they might be, um, why they, why they might be benefit, why they might benefit from these approaches. Um, and you know, I think that's an important. Um, that's one important strategy um, for sure. Um, you know, uh, 
all a, a sort of bigger picture strategy is, you know, back to the last question, you know, like research and um, is so, can be so uh, uh, separate from the social world, you know, especially research or research that's being done, you know, in laboratories or whatever that's, um, that if people, if, if more people are included, you know, from what have traditionally been excluded um, uh, communities and uh, subpopulations and so forth in the whole process of producing um, the science, then it will, again, in a more, in a longer term solution, a longer term approach, undoubtedly uh, expand the sense of, um, you know, legitimacy and probably will change some of the approaches as well. It won't just be, you know, we're doing the same old thing, but now, you know, it's black and brown people, for example, and women, not just, you know, more women, more black and brown women who are participating in this, um, you know, and they're still using the old models. They'll start to, they'll start to, um, you know, think about new ways of conducting studies and thinking about, um, and, you know, um, research from the biomedical to the social. So it's sort of, I think it's a multi-tiered kind of thing. There's some shorter term and some longer term kind of things that, um, you know, will build trust. The less we, you know, um, the more, uh, the fewer examples, of, uh, current and future examples of Tuskegee-like um, things that we have, um, you know, will help potentially build um, more confidence. Again, hopefully that would be uh, you know, an outcome of um, more inclusiveness in, um, in our scientific um, world as well. Yeah, and I'll leave with one thing on this one because uh, last week we had Mike Sag uh, come in to not only the DC CIFAR, but uh, an actual presentation to Howard University um, talking about COVID-19 and the reason for getting the vaccine. And he, he went into more detail about than what you see in the media, but he really was more of a direct um, communication and direct conversation with uh, faculty and students at Howard. And I was actually quite surprised about the number of students who emailed me afterwards saying that made so much more sense the way he presented it directly to them. And he said, they, the, the comments I was, I was getting back and I had I probably had more comments from that one seminar than any seminar I've had in the past 10 years. They were saying that now because of that conversation that they had with Mike, they're now going to have their, not only themselves be vaccinated, but they're talking to their family saying, Hey, mom, dad, and uncle, this is safe. We can do this now. Um, so I think, so Kim, I think you're exactly right, right there with uh, that, that building the trust, building it, going uh, uh, within the communities. Um, and I know we are a little bit over time right now, so I do want to thank everybody. Uh, Kim, thank you so much for a very enlightening and uh, amazing seminar. Um, this will be available at some point um, uh, on the DCC FAR website for a resource for, uh, fut uh, for the future as well. Okay, well, thank you for um, inviting me and um, for the good questions. And, uh, you know, like if anybody wants to talk about collaboration, <laughs> I'm happy to, um, I'm happy to, or answer other questions via email or whatever. Um, I'm, I'm here. Thank you, Kim. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Michael, for the suggestion. It was Michael that, you know, kind of asked me to do this. So I hope I lived up to your expectations. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Bye, everybody. everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye now. And I do want to say this, we're out there because I sit on several um, clinical AIDS clinical trial boards. And um, I just think if I hadn't did the hepatitis C vaccine stuff, I would not have been cured of, hep back with, of hepatitis C. So I had to trust something with somebody. Mm -hmm. And I know my body. And if something ain't right, I'll stop taking it. But, so, somebody, but somebody had to convince you and talk to you about it. Uh, uh, no, no, they did all the. Anytime you tell me about a vaccine that gonna help me, yeah. I'm for it. <laughs> okay. You know, because I had two friends that die on the study. But, but that can't remember. That that. Change me, change my mindset. Mm, yeah. Thank you, Yvette. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody.